Hola mis amigas! Welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to be getting back to the usual writing tips, writing advice videos. I know that my last several videos have been about my novel that's coming out, but I wanted to get back to sharing some writing advice with you all. So I thought it would be really timely as I kind of get back to my doing some writing advice videos to kind of give you just five, well originally I had five, two of them are kind of the same thing, but five simple and yet kind of profound things that can really help you boost the level and professionalism of your writing in really, really big ways. Just some things that will really, really help your writing be a lot better and a lot more professional and easy to read and smooth, for lack of a better word. It flows nicely. So the first thing is pretty basic, but I cannot stress it enough, good grammar. So first you should improve your grammar and then you should improve your style. There is a quote that I really, really like and I forget who said it, but it is learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist. There are always some uh, artistic exceptions to rules, but 99% of the time grammar is grammar and you will look a lot more professional if someone can really tell that you know how to properly use grammar. I'm not going to, on this channel, go into how to properly use grammar. I am sure that there are entire YouTube channels dedicated to that. And there are, of course, some courses, I'm sure, and things like that that you can take. But I cannot tell you how confidence boosting it is for me to have a very solid understanding of grammar and how much that cuts back on the amount of editing that I and others have to do with my work. So I'm just going to give you a really quick example of how proper grammar can help improve the flow of your sentences because one mark I feel like of really, really experienced writing or just very professional writing versus maybe more amateurish writing is for me the flow. Like flow is very important to me and all of these things will contribute to the flow and how well your writing transitions from one idea to the next. So I'm going to give you a really quick example of just one grammar com concept that can really make or break whether or not your writing looks professional. Now obviously a good understanding of grammar is not going to totally replace the need for an editor. I still had someone glance over my novel and edit it for me, but it will cut down on the amount of editing that it will need and it will also boost your confidence, not just when you hand it to an editor, but if you want to let anyone else read it before it has been uh, edited for grammar. So I'm going to give you a really quick example, and this example is something that I have seen before in kind of circles of kind of something that's been quickly thrown together. It's totally okay if you have really bad grammar in just something that you're throwing out there. It's okay. At the very beginning, you don't have to have your story perfect. That's what a first draft is for. But you also still want to be mindful and getting into good habits because, like I said, getting into good grammar habits will save you a lot of time later. So I'm going to show you a couple of sentences and then really quickly kind of show you what's wrong with them and why they don't flow correctly. Again, this is just one example out of many different grammar concepts, but it might just kind of give you an idea on how subtle things can really help. So here's my example sentence. I just made it up. It's not from anything. She tripped on her skirt, period, then fell down the hill period. Now, this one is actually a little bit tricky because when you first read it, it doesn't necessarily sound wrong. There are some sentences that whenever they're in two pieces like this, you can really tell there's something wrong. But in this sentence, there's a subtle problem, and that problem is that the second sentence is not a what's called complete sentence. A complete sentence always has a subject and a verb. The subject is the, is the entity that is carrying out the action, whether it is a concrete or abstract entity. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a person. And then the verb, of course, is whatever's being done. So in the first sentence, she, subject, tripped, verb. But the second sentence does not have a subject. It's just then fell down the hill. And this is something that I see fairly frequently in amateurish writing. And the way that you fix it is you just either blend the sentences together. For example, she tripped on her skirt and fell down the hill. That creates a sentence where you have two verbs in the same sentence, which is totally fine. You've joined them together with the conjunction. Again, I'm not going to go into very deep 
uh, English concepts here because that is out of the scope of this channel. Not because I don't love English and grammar, I do, but that's not really what we're going to be focusing on on this channel. But I'm sure, like I said, there are other channels where you can learn a whole boatload of information on grammar. So the other thing that you could do is you could split it into two sentences, leave it that way, but you could add a subject to the second sentence. She tripped on her skirt, then she fell down the hill. And there, of course, are lots of different variations on how you could do this. It depends on how you want the sentence to flow. But first, learn proper grammar, and then you can play with how the sentence flows, because starting with grammar will definitely improve the flow of your sentence already. Now, of course, there are always going to be some exceptions somewhere. For example, if you have a phrase like an interjection, like no, like the exclamation no, that's different. That's not treated the same way as a regular sentence. But this is something that comes with skill that I'm sure you will improve on, and I'm continually improving upon. I... I'm pretty confident in my understanding of grammar and sentence flow, but there are always still things that I'm learning and tweaking and adjusting as I learn more and get feedback and critique, and that's not something that you should be afraid of. Every writer has to learn how to courageously uh, put your work out there for critique, even if it's just a friend or a family member. It takes a lot of courage, but trust me, getting feedback and doing some research and improving your grammar will really, really boost your confidence, and it will also make your drafts if you are letting anyone else read them look a lot more professional and that should really boost your confidence. So the second tip I have for you is a style tip and that is dialogue labels. A dialogue label is whenever it describes how somebody says something. The most common one of course being said. For example, Sally said. Now, do not be afraid to use the word said. I use the word said, but I always try to be careful that I'm not using the same dialogue label more than once, kind of on a page, for lack of a better word. I just kind of keep it in the back of my head to be open to new words and to be finding new dialogue labels that I really like to use so that, that way there's lots of variety. Because if you ever read a book and you notice they kind of use the same dialogue label over and over and it's just like said, said, exclaimed, asked, replied, answered, those are all really good. But if there's too many, like, saids, for example, at times you can pick up on that and it can start to be a little bit monotonous and a little bit like, okay, can we get something else here? So some of my favorites, for example, are breathed, roared, gasped, stated, just anything that creates a little bit more of a vivid picture of how the person is saying it because that helps your reader envision the scene better and kind of hear the tone of their voice better. For example, if someone says something, it's going to come off very different than if they roar it, or yell it, or shout it, or whisper it. So that's just something that you can play with. I have a lot of fun with dialogue labels, and it's something that when you're first learning how to use it can be a little bit tricky and you know, you, there's a lot of them, and you just kind of slowly get more and more in your mind, like I said, and then you kind of have them there ready for you to use, and I'm sure if you got on Pinterest you could find all sorts of lists of words you can use instead of said. I know I've found some, and it's really fun to see kind of lots of different words, and sometimes it's just fun to find new words, if you know what I mean, and like, ooh, that's a pretty word. I remember one time I actually read a novel, and I actually flagged two places where there was a word I'd never heard before, and I wanted to find out what it meant so I could maybe use it in my stories because it seemed like a really cool word. The third slash fourth point is kind of the same thing but technically different. It's a very multifaceted kind of a thing and it is deep POV, deep point of view. Deep point of view is basically accomplishing in the third person what you get with the first person. Stay with me here. I'm kind of combining deep POV and consistent POV into the same point because they kind of play together. This is something that I have been working on for the last couple of years with editing my novel. My mom kind of helped me work on it, and it is when you're writing in the first person, you're using words like he, she, you're not using the first person where it's like I walked, or you're not using the second person, which is very rare, you walked. It's more he, she, you're describing your main character from the third person. Your audience is a spectator, not a character or a direct listener to the story. They're a spectator. So that can be fine just as it is, but there is a little trick on how you can immerse your readers more into the story. And there's not any one good way to explain it. If you are interested in me doing an entire separate video on this, do let me know down, the down in the comments. But deep POV is basically writing everything from the main 
character in the scene's perspective, but you're still in the third person. You're not using I, me, you know, you're not writing directly in the first person, you're not writing in their head, but you're still only showing details that they would know. I'm going to give you an example of this from my novel. Yes, I'm giving you a little sneak peek of my novel, and I'm going to compare the first draft of the story with what is now the final draft of the story, which is on my laptop. So, before I do this, I will say that there is a lot more than just one facet to deep POV, but one of the basic aspects is you make sure that you're mentioning details that the character from whose perspective you are writing, you're currently showing, is something that they would know. Um, and I'm going to explain that here in a minute. Let me find this page. As she looked up, Ruth's eyes met those of the captain. Now, it goes on to describe what the captain looks like. Now, this sounds fine, pulled out of context, but something my mom pointed out and something that we uh, went through and fixed throughout the entire story is that previous to this point we have not established that Ruth knows who the captain is and the reader has already met the captain because we jumped. We jumped between Ruth and the captain in the beginning of the story to give you a little sneak peek at both and meet them, meet their characters before they met in the story. But I had not established yet that she knows he's the captain. In fact, she doesn't know he's the captain. She doesn't know his name. And while that's a very subtle thing, it just ever so slightly could take the reader out and make them wonder, wait, does she know the captain already? Does she not? And this is something that throughout the entire book I had to be careful of. And if you're going to refer to a character by their name in front of another character, to try to make sure that that character would already know their name. And if not, find a quick way to introduce that character's name so that you can start referring to them by their name with that character's perspective. If this sounds confusing, just think of it this way. You're writing in the third person, but all the details you're mentioning, the main character in the scene, something that they would know. They can't look inside the heads of all the people around them and all of a sudden figure out everybody's names and stuff like that. And your reader might already know the names, but your character doesn't. And to further complicate this, you can change whose point of view you are writing from in a scene in the third person without going out of deep point of POV. So I did this at one point in the story where I switched between Ruth's point of view and the captain's point of view, I think in like chapter eight or something like that, because I wanted to get into the captain's thoughts, but I wanted to stay in deep POV when I was with Ruth, so I would swap between the two. And it really is a skill that you learn, and it's something that I didn't really do for a while. And it's something that now I've kind of, oops, I don't need that, I need my computer. It's something that I've kind of taken a liking to doing, and you don't have to do it, but it does create a somewhat more immersive uh, experience for your reader, as if they're kind of thinking and feeling and seeing things along with your main character, even though you're not directly writing in the first person from their perspective. Now I'm going to read to you that same passage from my book. It's from chapter one if you're curious, so I'm not spoiling anything for you. But I'm going to read to you the same passage from the final draft of the story. Ruth stumbled back and turned to see Captain Edward. Now the reader already knows who Captain Edward is, but here is where the trick is. She realized he must be the captain because of his clothes, and then it goes on to describe his clothes, and in comparison to a character she's already met, who we already know the name of. Now, this is subtle, but it clearly establishes to the reader that even though you know who Captain Edward is because you met him earlier, Ruth doesn't. And even though I still mention Captain Edward's name, I then clarify that she's just assuming he's the captain. Even though you already know he is, she's just assuming that at this point. So it takes some finesse, and I have had more than one version of this passage for sure. And like I said, I've gone through and tweaked this throughout the entire book, but it's just a little something something that your reader might not even notice, but it's immersing them just a little bit more because they're not being drawn out of the character wondering who knows who. They know who's who, but the main character not only doesn't necessarily know everyone's names, but they also don't know what everyone is thinking. And that's another aspect to Deep POV, and honestly there are a lot of different aspects to Deep POV, but this aspect kind of more the having a consistent POV is more what I wanted to focus on. And 
also part of having a consistent point of view is like I said not going into a different character's thoughts when you're focusing on one character's perspective from a scene you want to make a quick transition to a different character so that, that way it doesn't seem like it, it's just more immersive if you know what I mean so going on to the fifth point since the last two points kind of went together deep POV and consistent POV we're going to talk about character motivation and this is less about writing and more about the believability of your story itself and how much your reader can be immersed in your story from a character perspective so you have good grammar you have nice dialogue labels you have deep POV and consistent POV so you got all that flowing properly but I have found that I can have all of those things and still something seems off. This is part of what happened with my Camp NaNoWriMo project that I told you about that just didn't really end up working and that was because I didn't have clear character motivation. My characters both had kind of some internal struggles and fear but I didn't clearly communicate what they wanted and what they needed and their fear and this I have found is kind of the main pitfall of my own work whenever I get stuck is that I did not, prior to writing the story, clearly define what their fear is, what their want is, what their false belief is, and what their need is. And their want will basically be their motivation. And every character needs something that they value more than anything else in the world. And if you can make how they act be a hybrid of what they want more than anything in the world and them avoiding their fear, then all of a sudden you're they're going to be consistent they're going to be somewhat predictable and your audience is going to be able to hook into the conflict more because they realize like hey okay here we are presented with a situation and I can feel the tension because I know that it is making her afraid but let's say it also presents her with an opportunity to get what she wants so if you clearly define what your character wants and what they're afraid of and what they need then you can directly play into that with the conflict and all of a sudden it becomes a lot more tense and a lot more believable and a lot more engrossing because your audience knows your character and what they want and how they're going to react to some degree because they know their motivation and they will know that this situation they're being presented with is directly going to cause a reaction with their motivation and their fear. So all of these points are tips that can help your writing be more professional, flow better, and then also just be more engrossing and hook your reader better. Of course there are a lot of different things that go into crafting good work whenever you're writing, no matter what it is, whether it's a story or an article or whatever it is, but these five things or these four things, depending on how you want to categorize it, really help me write consistent good work if I can pull them all off together. I don't do it every time. Sometimes I mess these points up and sometimes you're going to mess these points up and that's okay. That's not only what an editor is for but that's also what practice is for and like I am learning to say more and more, time spent practicing your craft is never wasted time even if it's not something you end up doing anything with. You're learning your craft and you're practicing and you're becoming more skilled at whatever it is you're doing and that's always worth the time and effort. And don't forget too that no matter where you are on these points, even if you are just starting out and maybe you've never even heard of some of these points before, just know that you're exactly where you need to be for where you are. You're exactly where God wants you to be. And if he wants you to use this writing thing for his glory, he's going to help you through this journey and he's going to give you the skills you need, even if they're not exactly what you think you need or what someone else says you need. He's going to equip you as he sees you need to honor him with this skill that you have and this thing that you are using to honor him. So I hope that gives you some encouragement and maybe just a little something something to go boost your confidence a little bit. I know that for me when I find kind of a new skill, like when I discovered kind of keeping the consistent POV, it really boosted my confidence and kind of changed how I looked at the story a little bit. So maybe that's just provided some encouragement for you. I will see you guys again next week. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you enjoy not only writing advice, but also encouragement in your writing journey with the Lord. I will see you next time. Adios mis amigas y Dios le bendiga. Have a blessed day. Get out there and write the story that God created you to write. Happy writing!